And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Murder Arrangement. The darkness of the deserted road was exaggerated by the shroud of trees lining either side. Larry Sims, bending over, trying to fix the tire on his car, felt very much alone, and he worked clumsily, impatiently. He straightened up at the sound of another car approaching very fast. Suddenly, the other car swerved in toward him. He leaped back just in time. It almost struck him down as its fender scraped his. Larry sprang forward again as the speeding vehicle rushed on. He tried to catch a glimpse of the driver, the number on the license plates. But the car, its lights off, was quickly swallowed up in the night. And all that Larry knew for certain was that someone had followed him, deliberately tried to kill him. He was still shaking nervously as he drove back to town. Even the friendly lights on the outskirts failed to cheer or calm his fears. He drove directly to an apartment, left his car in the alley, hurried upstairs. He had to ring the door buzzer several times before the door opened. I've got to see you, Mildred. Well, Larry, isn't this rather an odd hour to Let be me in, Mildred, quickly. I've got to talk to you. Well, certainly, come in. You've never seen Larry so upset, have you, Mildred? His face is drained of color. His eyes, wild with fear, are blinking nervously as he quickly surveys the room. As if he expected someone else to be there. Someone he fears. Apparently satisfied that you're alone, he turns to you suddenly. Mildred, he's out of prison, isn't he? Fred Belton, I mean. Out? Well, yes, why? I knew it. I figured he'd get that parole. You'd better have a drink, Larry. You're actually shaking. Fred tried to kill me. He tried to run me down tonight on a lonely road. What? Oh, you do need a drink. I'll fix it, Satan. I was trying to fix a tire. He came at me out of the darkness, driving fast. You've been listening to too many mystery programs, darling. There are much neater ways to kill people now. Neater and cleaner. Here's your drink. Mildred, you've got to believe me. Have you seen Fred talk to him? Yes. As a matter of fact, I drove up to state prison this morning and met him, going back to the city. And you didn't call me? Mildred, you know I've been worried about him, trying to avoid him. Oh, Larry, I do believe you're afraid of Fred. It's putting it mildly. Mildred, what am I going to do? You know he thinks I framed him, double-crossed him. Did he... Did he mention anything? Ask about me? No. Mildred, you're keeping something from me. He's made you promise not to warn me. He just wants to walk in on me. Larry! Your drink is getting warm. And so are you. Look, if you're so concerned about Fred, why not hide out for a few days? I've got to do something. I can't just sit around, wait to run into him. Guilty conscience, Larry. Mildred, you know I didn't have anything to do with framing Fred. I wasn't even around when Fred got picked up. I was at the cabin, at the crest line. Well, then, you've got nothing to worry about. Mildred, please, help me think of some place to hide. Well, if you're that worried, I suppose he has had too much time on his hands in prison. I mean, too much time to think. Say, I know, Larry. What? Joan's apartment. She's out of town for a week. She left her key with me. Fred doesn't even know Joan. Wonderful. I'll go there right now, tonight. You can get in touch with me when you know something, huh? 
Oh, you know best. I'll get you the key. If you, if you hear anything, that is, if I'm wrong about Fred, you'll let me know. You know I will. I I'll talk to him tomorrow. Oh, aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? You bet I am. Oh, you're okay, Mildred. You understand. I, I, I had to have somebody to talk to tonight. A thing like it's this. It's all right. And maybe you're right. At least you'll feel safer at Jones. And Larry, the next drink I fix for you. Yeah. You'll be able to stay and finish it. Good night, Larry. Fred, I'm only telling you... Mildred, you know I'm not after Larry. Well, he seems to think you are. That's why I sent for you this morning, to tell you to stay away from him. You, you don't deny you'd like to talk with him. No, I don't. I told you that yesterday. Not to kill him, Mildred. Larry wouldn't have the guts to frame anybody, least of all me. But he just might have an idea who did. I doubt that. I mean, he might have some information that I could fit in somewhere. Maybe even something he doesn't realize, something that would uh, give me the whole story. And um, when you know the whole story? Well, I told you that too, sweetheart, but I'll elaborate. Now, there's three things I want out of life now. One, there's a chance for a decent break. Two, the guy that sent me up... And three? You, Mildred. <sighs> you, uh, you didn't lose your technique in prison, did you? Just made the appetite sharper, that's all. From your punctuality this morning, I'd say it also sharpened your attention to schedule. Yeah, it did. You know, I don't mind that part, the routine, everything on the dot... Okay with oh, me. Fred, why don't you stop worrying about who framed you and why? There are other things to think about. I know. But I'll get to them, baby. On schedule. In their proper time and place. Hmm? You know best. And you won't stay away from Larry? Nope. Might as well tell me where to find him. So you can talk? That's all, I promise. He's not the guy I'm after. I'm sorry, Fred. I think too much of you to let you get into trouble. When you're on parole, you've got to watch your step. Okay, but I'll find it myself. You do believe it, though, don't you? I had nothing to do with trying to run him down the car last night. I'll try to believe it. I want to. Because, well, you know. Sure, I know. Come here, man. You, you'd better go now. Okay, like you said, uh, parolees have to watch their behavior, huh? Something like that. See you soon? Of course. Good night, friend. Hello? Mildred Carson, please. Speaking. Oh, Miss Carson, this is Jennings. You know, you drive car rentals? Yes? Hey, about that car you rented from us last night. What about it? Well, the right fender was badly scraped. You know, you should have reported that to me. You see, there's a charge for anything like that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, just send me the bill. Oh, well, uh, how'd it happen, Miss Carson? Well, I really don't know. It must have been while it was parked somewhere. I really didn't have anything to do with it. Well, it's okay to send the bill to you then, huh? That's right. I'll be glad to settle it. It will be a pleasure. Good night, Mr. Jennings. <laughs> First tonight, I'd like a word with the ladies. In these days of budget-pinching high prices, you're naturally interested in ways to save money. And Signal's amazing new motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication, 50%, is designed to do just that for you. You see, by keeping that light new pep and power in your car twice as long, new Signal Premium motor oil helps your car go twice as far before needing an expensive engine overhaul. So there's a big saving in maintenance costs. Secondly, if your car isn't already an oil eater, new Signal Premium, by reducing engine wear, 50% should double the number of miles during which you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption. 
So there's another big saving in oil. But of course, the time to prevent engine wear is before it happens. So why not show that man in your life what a smart, practical little lady you really are by suggesting that he get the car's oil changed now at a signal station. Suggest that he get it changed to new Signal Premium, the heavy-duty type oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication. 50%. Well, Mildred, you missed out, didn't you? In your desperate attempt to run Larry Sims down in that rented automobile. The only fortunate thing about it is that he didn't catch a glimpse of you driving when he leaped back just in time. But you still have Fred Belton to deal with. Stubborn, orderly-minded Fred, who won't rest until he talks to Larry. Tries to learn from him who was responsible for his arrest a few years ago. You know what'll happen if the two meet, don't you? Larry will say something you're certain that Fred can add to the facts he now holds. It will add up to one terrible thing, won't it? That it was you, Fred's supposed sweetheart, who tipped off the police and brought about his arrest. You must keep Larry out of sight, Mildred. Keep Fred from locating him, talking to him. But it can't go on indefinitely. So there's something else you must do. Yes, you've got to try again. And next time, you know you can't afford to miss. You're pacing the floor of your apartment, wondering what to do and how and when. As you hear a knock on the door, you nervously open it and sigh with relief as you realize it's Macaulay, the parole officer assigned a check on Fred Belton. Oh, Lieutenant Macaulay, come in. Well, thanks, Miss Carson. I haven't time. Just a word right here, if you don't mind. A word about Fred Belton. Yes, what about it? He isn't in trouble. No, no, not yet. I'd like to keep it that way as much as you would. Oh, well, he's just a friend. Yeah, I know. You said that the other day when you asked about meeting him upstate. Fred's landlady said differently. She said you liked the guy. Uh, nosy, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Well, all right. So I like Fred Belton. He's pretty. And you want to keep him out of trouble. And I want to keep him out of trouble. So what's going on? Well, we got a call at headquarters. A call from Larry Sims. Know him? Yes? Well, Larry Sims is a worried gent. Thinks Fred tried to kill him the other night. Thinks it isn't safe for him to come back to town. So? So? What do you think? So I think Fred isn't that foolish. I understand he isn't even carrying a gun. Mm, maybe not. But Fred Belton's got a bad temper, Miss Carson. Uh, just a friendly suggestion. Uh, keep him away from Larry, huh? I'll try. You could keep him away from anybody. Then I'll really try. Good. That's all? Uh, that's all. Well, nice to meet you, officer. A cop who's really interested in giving a guy a break. <laughs> There's a lot of us like that. You know that. Yeah, maybe I do. All right. And thanks, anyway, for Fred. You watch Lieutenant Macaulay walk down the corridor out of sight. He's given you an idea, hasn't he, Mildred? Yes, an excellent idea. The solution to your problem. Because if Larry Sims turns up dead soon, the first suspect will be Fred Belton. But you'll need one thing, won't you, Mildred? Proof. You've got to have something that will tie Larry's death to Fred without question. And something that you said, your own words coming back in your mind, provide the answer to that one. I understand he isn't even carrying a gun. That will do it, won't it, Mildred? He isn't supposed to be carrying a gun. No, but you're sure you can arrange that. Just as you're sure you can arrange Larry Sims' murder. You determine to start the arranging at once. The first step, an evening visit to Fred Belton's landlady. Yes, what is it? Oh, Miss Carson. Good evening, Mrs. Elkins. Do come in, my dear. Well, I only stopped by for a minute. I wondered if you'd do me a favor. Why, of course. I have a package here, a little gift for Fred. 
Mr. Belton, I was wondering if you'd let me into his apartment. I'd like to leave it there. It's sort of a surprise. Of course, of course. I'll give you my keys. Oh, well, I, I'd rather you came with me. You see, well, there's something I want to talk with you about. Oh? Well, all right, Miss Carson. Be with you in a minute. Has it been a lovely day? Yes, quite lovely. Dear me, now, where did I put my key ring? I... Oh, here it is. Come along, my dear. Um, how is your husband, Mrs. Elkins? Oh, same as usual. Oh, really, now, I must speak to him again about this elevator door. Stick something terrible. Ah, there we are. Now, come along, Miss Carson. There was something you wanted to talk to me about? Yes, it, it, it's about Fred, Fred Belton. Nicest tenant I've had in the building ever, believe me. He was here for years, long before he... Uh, well, you know. Yes. He's changed a bit, of course. It does that to a man, I suppose, all those years behind bars. But still in all, uh, uh, here we are. Uh, Miss Elkins, just a minute before you open the door. I, I had a visitor yesterday, Fred's parole officer. Tall, well-built man, sandy hair. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've seen him here several times. He's worried about Fred. Oh? And frankly, so am I. Fred's been acting strangely. There's something on his mind. He seems to be brooding about something. Really, Mrs. Elkins, I am worried. Oh, now, now, now. I don't think Mr. Belton's apt to be doing anything wrong. I wish I could be sure. Well, thanks anyway for letting me tell you about it. This way. Mrs. Elkins, uh, I'd like to ask another favor. Of course. What is it? Well, if you could just sort of, I don't know, keep, keep an eye on Fred for me. Let me know if he does anything unusual, the slightest little thing that doesn't seem right. I'd be glad to tell you, Miss Carson. There's very little goes on in this building that I don't know about. Here we are. Well... Now that that's off my mind, where will I hide this package? I don't want Fred to find it right away. Let me see. Um, uh, uh, there's the bookcase over here, or that chair. You could put it behind the pillow. No, I know, the bedroom, in a drawer somewhere. Good idea. Oh, yes, yes, I think this will be fine. I... What is it, my dear? Well, I thought I heard footsteps in the hall. Do you suppose... Oh, dear, it wouldn't do to have Fred catch us here. Wouldn't be much of a surprise, would it? <laughs> no. I'll go and see. You don't waste a minute, do you, Mildred? As soon as she's out of the room, you step quickly to the bureau, open the bottom drawer, and drop the revolver on top of the shirt. You close it again. And you're standing by the window, looking out, when Mrs. Elkins returns. Not a soul there, my dear. Oh, well, thank goodness. For a moment, I was certain Fred had caught us red-handed. Well, now, let me see. The bureau seems like a good place to hide the package. Where does Fred keep his shirts, do you know? Bottom drawer, I think. Yes, here they are. I... Oh, dear. What's wrong, Mrs. Elkins? Look at this. A gun. What's Fred doing with a gun? Dear, dear, Oh, I don't dear. like this. I don't like it at all. The idea of Fred with a gun. I... Oh, Mrs. Elkins, you mustn't say anything to anyone. I I'll talk to Fred myself right away. He's got to get rid of this gun. You're quite right. It'll only lead to trouble for him, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Maybe you could take it with you. No. No, I'm afraid that would make him angry. We'd better leave it just where it is. But the next time I see him, I I'll talk to him about it. I I'll tell him to dispose of it. I guess that is best. I'm sure it is. I, I, I wonder where he is right now. I have no idea. He went out late this afternoon. Oh, then he's probably downtown. Mrs. Elkins, is there a pencil and paper handy? I I'd like to leave him a note. Of course, my dear. There's some over there on uh, Fred's desk. I'll have to run now. Uh, help yourself. Uh, and don't forget to lock up when you leave. No, I won't. It's working beautifully, isn't it, Mildred? Your little plan. Everything falling neatly into place. And now, with Mrs. Elkins gone, you make the next move. Take the gun out of the drawer and replace it in your purse. Then you drop the gift package into the drawer and close it. You move quickly to the window by the fire escape. Unlock it and open it slightly. Then you leave a note for Fred, asking him to call you. And hurry back to your own apartment to wait. Shortly before nine, your telephone rings. 
Yes. Hello, Millie. Oh, Fred. Uh, I got your message just now, and a gift. Thanks, but how come? Oh, it, it's not much, really. I just wanted to surprise you. I happened to be out shopping, saw the ties, and thought you'd like them. Well, I do, thanks. Fred, the reason I asked you to call, I've got to talk to you. It's very important. Okay, let's have it. Oh, no, not over the phone. I'll meet you somewhere. Uh, the park? Wait a minute, Mildred. What's up? I'll explain later. Meet me at the park near the fountain at 10 o'clock. Can you make it? 10 o'clock it is. I'll be there, right on the nose. You can be certain of that, can't you, Mildred? Yes, Fred's always been very punctual. And you know he'll be there on time, just when you want him to be. Now you're ready for the next step, aren't you? You hurry downstairs to the garage, get into your car, and drive across town to the apartment where Larry Sims is hiding out. Who, who is it? It's Mildred, Larry. Let me in. What are you doing here, Millie? I came to warn you. What? You better get your hat and coat. Fred is on his way. Fred, come here? Yeah. But how did you find out? I him? don't know how he found out, but that's not important now. You've got to get out of here. And fast. I still think it's my only chance, Millie. I'm not so sure I've it is. got to get out of town, that's all, and keep running. Where will you go? Remember, it costs money to run and keep running. Yeah, I know that. Okay, okay, so you got any other ideas? Yes, I think so. What are you doing? Why are we stopping? The park is as good a place as any to talk things over. And we have things to talk over, Larry. Okay, okay. All right, come on, let's get out. Look, why can't we just sit here come and... Come on, Larry. We've got to figure something out for you. I can think much better when I'm walking. All right. Have it your way. You know, darling, I really don't have to get mixed up in this. I'm only trying to help you. Sure, sure, I know, Millie. I'm sorry. You're okay, Strictly okay to do this for me. Thanks. Tipping me off about Fred. Saving my life. Millie, I'll never forget you. No. No, I don't think you ever will. That would be ten o'clock, wouldn't it, Larry? Yeah, sure. So what? So, this. Hey, what? It's the idea of the gun. The idea, Larry, darling, is that I'm going to kill you. Now, if I can have a word with you men, I'd like to get technical for a moment and tell you some of the extra benefits you enjoy when you change to Signal's amazing new motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. One, new Signal Premium motor oil stops acid corrosion and rust. Two, it prevents sticking of hydraulic valve lifters. Three, it keeps oil rings clean and free. And four, it controls and reduces harmful engine deposits such as carbon, gum, and varnish. Best of all, Signal stations bring you this superior quality heavy-duty type oil at no increase in price. So you see, mister... If earlier in this program your wife suggested that you get your car's oil changed at a signal station, she really deserves a compliment for being so smart, so practical, in recommending Signal Premium, the amazing new Signal motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Well, Mildred, it went perfectly, didn't it? You're certain of that, aren't you? Yes, every step of the way, just as you'd arranged it. Larry Sims is dead, and you've already put the murder weapon, the gun, back in Fred Belton's apartment, in the bottom bureau drawer where Mrs. Elkins saw it earlier this evening. It was clever of you to leave Fred's window by the fire escape open, wasn't it? No one saw you enter or leave his apartment. 
Now, back in your own apartment, a little less than two hours after you murdered Larry, left him lying in the park, you congratulate yourself, confident that the case against Fred Belton is airtight. Standing there in the open doorway is the lieutenant from police headquarters, Fred Belton's parole officer. Good evening, Miss Carson. Well, well, hello. May I come in? Please do. Still worried about Fred? He's been taken into custody. What's that? You remember this Larry Sims I was telling you about the last time I was here? Why, yes. He was afraid Fred was going to kill him. Mm-hmm. Sims is dead, Miss Carson. His body was found in the park an hour oh, ago. Oh, no. No, you don't mean that Fred... He denies killing Sims, but we found the murder weapon, a thirty-eight, in Fred Belton's apartment. I see. You had a date with Fred Belton tonight, didn't you? Well, he I... He says you did. Uh, yes, we had a date tonight. Miss Carson, uh, I've heard Fred Belton's version of what happened tonight. Suppose now you tell me yours. But I... Well, all right, I, I guess I may as well tell you everything. I had nothing to do with the killing. Fred called me and asked me to meet him at the park, and I did. I, I didn't know what Fred was going to do. Then when Larry Sims showed up, there was an argument. Go on, Miss Carson. Uh, well, Fred had a gun. I, I tried to stop him, but, well, he'd have killed me, too. I, I had to stand by helplessly and watch him kill Larry. You know, Miss Carson, you've just about talked yourself into the gas chamber. What? You see, Fred Belton's landlady, Mrs. Elkins, was worried about him. She thought it her duty to tell us that Belton had a gun. Fred's on parole, you know, and a parolee isn't allowed to have a gun in his possession. <laughs> Mrs. Elkins told you this? Yes. She phoned us early this evening. Fred Belton never did get out to the park to keep that date with you, Miss Carson. We had him in custody an hour before the murder. He's been with us at headquarters all evening. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. And this week, if you want to do your car and your budget a favor, get your car's oil changed to Signal Premium, the amazing new motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Get it changed at a Signal service station by the same friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Joan Banks, Larry Blake, Betty Blythe, David Ellis, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Harden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>